What the kings and queens? It's your boy Dan from Daft Previews, and I'm here to take you through a comprehensive NBA player prop preview for this upcoming two game slate. If it's your first time checking out the channel, I'll let you know I do this every single day. I preview all the key players, talk about their matchups, form lines, I'll give you some insights, I'll tell you what I like, and I'll tell you what I don't, and I'm hoping to give you all the information that you need to make the best bets possible. Now, in the last video, I dropped a whole list of leans. Lo and behold, that list of leans wasn't so very successful. So yeah, another losing day from my end, and it absolutely sucks, and I take full accountability for it, but I promise you, it's not from a lack of trying. So got to figure out what's happening in these playoffs. So I want to reverse engineer it a little bit. Instead of just reviewing the bets I took, let's review the last two games that happened to see where we went right, where we went wrong, and see if we can piece it all together. So I'll start with the Knicks and the Pacers game. So we'll jump straight into that one, and then we'll review the Denver game and see if we can get any insights from that, learn from what the hell's been happening. All right, so in that last game, the Pacers won 111 to 106. Now, in terms of the outcome, that's what I expected to happen, the Pacers to win in a close game. So that went the way I thought it would go. Now, going through the box score, firstly looking at these New York Knicks players, we had Josh Hart, 10 points, 4 assists, and 18 rebounds. None of those I saw coming. Believe it or not, I was a bit worried about the rebounds. I felt more confident in the points and the assists. But shit, I completely read that one wrong. So a rebounding beast there. We saw Precious Achua in the starting lineup, but he still only played 21 minutes. Five points and only six rebounds. We didn't take any plays on him, which was good. Um, it looked like the Knicks were happy to play Josh Hart at the four more often because Miles McBride and Alec Burks actually got some run time off the bench. What else do we see? Isaiah Hardenstein, six points, eight rebounds, five assists. The assist prop was the only one that caught my attention, but I wasn't sure if that was because Brunson was injured in the last game. But yeah, he managed to hit his assist line pretty easily. Dante DiVincenzo, 35 points, seven three-pointers made, 26 shots. Now that was one of the plays that I felt confident in taking. And for the life of me, I did not take it, but I was spot on with a read there. We had Jalen Brunson, 26 points and six assists. So he went under both of his lines once again, still took 26 shots in that game, but the percentage was off. That's honestly something we should have been able to pick up because the volume would be there, but could be somewhat hampered by that injury. And we saw that. So I think we're going to see lower lines the next time the Knicks play, and that could be a, a good look. We had Miles McBride get 28 minutes off the bench, uh, scoring 10 points, two rebounds. And I wasn't sure if Miles McBride was going to get those type of minutes, given that Tibbs only likes to play seven players, but Miles McBride with no OG, you can expect these types of minutes from him moving forward. Alec Burks had 14 points, four rebounds, which is somewhat decent. So we'll see what happens in the next game. He should get at least 20 minutes so we can go back and look at everything that happens when he plays 20 minutes. So yeah, in this particular game, I think the main one I read wrong there was Josh Hart. That was the main one I read wrong, whereas the others are pretty Somewhat confident that I read them all the right way. Brunson, I didn't like his overs. I wasn't man enough to bet his unders, but that was a good look. Dante DiVincenzo, we were right on the money with. Isaiah Hardenstein assists were definitely there. It's just, yeah, Josh Hart was the main one that I read wrong. I don't think I took any bets on Josh Hart, but it's still a wrong read. Now, looking at these Indiana Pacers, my Lord, I read a lot of these right too, but I fucking didn't bet them. God damn it. Uh, let's have a look. Naismith, 10 points, six boards. I had no insights in him. Pascal Siakam scored 26 points. I expected a big improvement from him to the free throw line, 14 shots, made his only three pointer with seven boards. So the points for Pascal Siakam was a good read. Miles Turner predicted a bounce back as well. He scored 21 points, 10 boards. But again, I managed to talk myself out of that, but that was a good look. Uh, Nemhard, uh, I think we're only really liking his assists, I believe. I think three and a half assists. Let me check this out real quick. Leans, where's my Nemhard? Yeah, I think it was three and a half assists for Nemhard was the main thing. And he had hit that in like nine consecutive games. And he had six assists in this game. Maurice Halliburton's got 35.7 assists. So I said the volume was great in the last game. And again, I talked myself out of it somehow, but he took 26 shots in this one. So... That could have been a great cash. It was a good read. I didn't like his assist prop, but the points one I thought was a good look. Um, and then the bench guys. I think this is why I didn't bet a lot of them. <laughs> this is why I didn't bet Miles Turner, Siakam, and Tyrese Halliburton because I think the numbers must have swayed me. Ben Shepard had bet on his points. He shot one from five and he didn't cash. TJ McConnell bet on his points plus assist, but everybody bet on his points plus assist. So that one was probably too obvious to read and it 
and it blew our faces. He, he got the minutes, he got the shot attempts, just didn't happen to deliver. And we fell into the OB top and bait. He only scored two points. We took his over 10 and a half, which was a gut buster. Um, and again, a very popular play. He'd been hitting for so long and it just didn't happen. So far out. Talked myself out of the good ones, took the shit bets. And why did I take the shit bets? Because they had been hitting more consistently. So this hitting consistently thing has got to go. It's the playoffs. So when we review the props today, we'll probably try to avoid the hitting consistency type of bullshit because it doesn't seem to be working. We're looking to the Denver Nuggets versus Minnesota Timberwolves game, and the Nuggets blew them out. I did not see that. I saw the Nuggets playing a lot better, but not this much better. Uh, 27-point win, which is wild uh, on the road. But let's talk through these Denver Nuggets. So we had Michael Porter Jr. had 21 points, four rebounds. I did expect a bounce back for Michael Porter Jr., but I was worried about his volume. The volume did not get there, but the shot percentage was great. 60% from the field, 80% from deep. At Aaron Gordon, he only had two rebounds, and I was looking at the under five and a half rebounds. I was saying it. I said it loud and clear, and I managed to talk myself out of it. Jokic, we expect, or I expected a much better game from him, which he did. He didn't cover his points line, though, but 24 points, 14 boards, nine assists. So uh, we read an improvement, but we still would have been wrong if we took that bet. CP, I chose not to look at him at all, but he got 12 points. He covered his line with ease. I think it was seven and a half his line. And then we had Jamal Murray. Now, unders was the most obvious bet looking at the data, but I told y'all that the Jamal Murray overs, I got a feeling, and he finally delivered. 11 from 21, 52% from the field. He scored 24 points. But the other lane I had of Jamal Murray was under five and a half assists. And then for some reason, I just didn't take it. So, and again... I can't explain that. Um, but, yeah, for the most, a lot of the ones in Denver, uh, we had a pretty good read on. And then as we head to Minnesota, I uh, read this one completely wrong. Well, I didn't expect them to lose by 27, but we had Jaden McDaniel score 10 points. I didn't think he could do that. Carl Anthony Towns, very efficient from the field, but he only took seven shot attempts in this game. Uh, 10 points, five boards. That was trash. Rudy did nothing on his return. Anthony Edwards scored 19 points in 37 minutes, but he only took 15 shots. I took this play because in the previous game, he only took 17 shots. I expected a bit more from him. He took less shots. He didn't get to the free throw line at all. Uh, six boards, five assists. He had five turnovers. So a minus 32, the worst on the floor with Cat. We had Mike Conley. We bet his rebounds prop. That cash with ease. He scored 10 points, six rebounds, six assists. So I would have got close to his PRA. And then we took Nas Reed. And again, the Nas Reed thing was more so like he's been a beast so far. Will he continue to do it? I said they don't have an answer for him, but hey, maybe they do. He only scored seven points, only had one rebound off the bench, two from seven from the field. So yeah, disappointing night for me as a better. I had a lot of good reads. I just for some reason, managed to talk myself out of the good ones. So I'm just trying to summarize the reasons why. Talk myself out of the good ones because there were other players who were more consistent. So this consistent bullshit has got to go. Consistency means nothing in the playoffs, and I keep falling for it time and time again. But now, even if players are consistently hitting this number, I'm not putting it on my leans list. I think what's killing me at the moment is I take all these leans, and there's just so many there. And then when I'm trying to filter out the ones I like and don't like, the ones that are more consistent seem like the safer option for me. So we're not going to do that shit anymore. Let's get into this preview and see what we come up with. There's going to be some real shit. You ready for that? That sounds interesting. Let's go. All right. We're looking at the OKC versus Dallas Mavericks game, and you can see it on my screen. This game starts at 5 a.m. my time, so I'm spewing. I'm not even going to get to watch this one. I might catch the end of it, but let's talk through it, shall we? So Dallas got the win. It's 1-1. Not going to open the box score. Let's just go raw. Let's go through all these players. Let's start with OKC first. They are on the road. We'll start with SGA because my man's been a beast. Now, we're not going to take any bets just because they have been doing it. We need something something different. I guess for these star players, maybe we could. I don't know. I might be able to talk myself into it. But let's start with SGA's points first. His line is at 29 and a half. 29 in game one, 33 in game two. He's covered this line in three of his last 10. And against the Mavericks, he's covered in five out of his last nine. So last two games, 37 and 42 minutes. Field goal attempts, 19 and 24 in that second game. 
from downtown. He's made a couple of free threes, and he only made six free threes in that last game. But because he shot more, made more, he ended up covering his line anyway. So this is not a player who's hit consistently. What we have seen is Dallas came back to stun them. The main challenge that they have is defending SGA. So it makes perfect sense for me to look at the lean to the over here for SGA. Purely on OKC need him to be great. Um, you kind of lost home court advantage by dropping one game. So SGA, in my opinion, he needs to be big in this one. And points-wise, he can get his shot off whenever he wants. Watching, I watched that whole game, that last one, and there is no one that they can put on him to slow him down. Uh, shot percentage, pretty decent. It's just all about volume. Now, Dallas, will they double him? Potentially not. I would lean to the over in this one, but the only reason I'm leaning to the over, it's got nothing to do with the data, is I think the volume will still be there. He should take at least 20 shots in this game. On the road, this is what this is what typically happens. On the road, role players tend to take a step back, and your star players like SGA should pick it up. So, yeah, I don't love this enough to, to bet it, but that's definitely the way that I'm leaning, the over. Now, let's have a look at his assist prop, though. Six and a half. He's covered this in both games. Nine and eight assists in the two games. 13 and 14 potential assists. So he needs to get seven assists for this to cash. Uh, this is a plus money play too. So he's cash in both of those. Now, I would normally say, yeah, if he's getting nine and eight assists, the 12, 13 and 14 potential assists, why not look at the over? But if I'm going to reverse engineer the way that I've been looking at things, the under might be the way to go here. So if we look at historical form, he's cashed this in four of nine games. Outside of the two games they've already played in the playoffs, he only cashed in two out of seven games against the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, looking at his last 10, he's cashed this line in only three of his last 10. So if you remove the two games where he has cashed, he's only cashed in one of his last eight. So in looking at his potential, potential assists, um, over the last four games they've increased, but... Yeah, I, I would normally just bet the over on this straight away for plus money, but it's plus money for the reason sports books only giving you minus 142 for the under. So the under is heavily favored here for SGA's assist prop, despite going over in the last two. Now, the odds for this aren't great. Don't get me wrong. Odds for this aren't great. Um, so I wouldn't bet this as a straight bet, but I would be leaning the under here based on what we've seen so far in this playoffs. His rebound line is at six and a half. So he's been rebounding like a freak. Nine rebounds and 12 rebounds in the two games. Uh, this is a game that I think OKC keep competitive uh, after dropping that one game at home. I think they keep it competitive. His rebound chances have been very high. 15 and 17 rebound chances. So this is one where I would lean to the... Oh, geez. Would I lean to the over? The line's at six and a half, minus 105. And he's been rebounding like a freak. 21 rebounds in the last two games. 10.5 rebound as an average, and his line is at six and a half, and you need to get seven. These rebound chances are very high. So how do we not take the over here? I'm just trying to think. What change? <laughs> this sports betting shit is frustrating as hell because now I'm, I'm just doubting everything, but this makes too much sense to me. The assist prop, I can probably see that. that I can see why they're leaning towards the under players not shooting as well on the road and all that type of stuff, which which is a real thing. Rebound-wise, that comes down to Dallas missing shots and SGA getting some boards. So, um, you know, Dallas, not absolute machines at home. They did drop a home game to the Clippers as well. Keep that in mind. So OKC could well and truly steal one on the road here. And that means that, you know, Dallas will miss some shots and OKC going to have to get them boards. So... Yeah, I think the over here for SGA is is what I'm thinking. It's a plus EV play, according to Outlier. So, yeah, let me know what you guys think. I strongly encourage you guys to get involved with the chat and the comments section because I'm obviously not crushing it out here, and I'd love to hear your opinions on the matter. So next we have Chet Holmgren. So his line is at 15.5 points. I did lean to his under in that last game, which would have cashed. He scored 11 points. His line is at 16.5. So he's had... He's gone for 19 and 11 points in the game so far. This is looking at the under. So let me switch to the over real quick. So he's gone over this line in three of his last 10 games, which is not great. And against Dallas, he's only gone over this line in one of his last six. In that last game, he played 37 minutes, took 12 shots, shot 33% from the field, uh, one from six from deep. So he couldn't get hit in there. 
I want to have a quick look at the injuries to see is Gafford on this list. No. So Gafford's not on a game time decision, so he looks right to go. Whatever he did to his finger, don't worry about it. So uh, Chet's probably going to see very similar defense than what he has seen throughout uh, this series. What I want to do is I want to break down his last 10, check out his numbers home ver- on the season versus away. So this season, this is an average. On the road, 16.02. So he does drop about one one point on the road by the looks of it. There is a bit of a reduction there. So this is a particular play where I would lean to the under as well. Um, 12 shots, 15 and a half. Doesn't get to the free throw line very much at all. So unless there's a read on him making a lot more three-pointers, then I can't see him going over in this one. The attempts were quite high, but he wasn't getting him the ball. So Chet Holmgren, the under 15 and a half points is what I'm thinking. Now, it's got nothing to do with how often he's hit this in the last two games. It's really about the season data and him regressing to the mean because against Dallas, he's only averaging 13 points across six games and his line is at 15 and a half. I think there might be an edge to take his under. His assist prop, now he got a lot of assists in that last game. Six assists. Line is at one and a half, minus 190 though, so that's no good. Uh, he had six potential assists and managed to convert them all, which is outlandish. I don't think that happens again. But yeah, at one and a half assists, who wants to play that? We then look at his rebounds line, eight and a half board. So he's covered this in three of six games against Dallas. So far in this series, seven and six. He had 22 potential rebound chances in that last game and only finish on six with that number of rebound chances you would honestly be expecting at least 10 to 12 boards here from chet so i'm thinking to fade this and look at the over that's what i'd be leaning right now i know the rebound chances really high in the second game not high in the first game but if we're looking to reverse engineer this shit then yeah why can't check at nine boards He's done it before against Dallas. Three out of the four regular season games, he cashed this rebound line. Um, they're going to have to be dogs at home, I mean, on the road, to steal this victory. Um, if we look at his recent form, he's only hit this in one of his last five games too. He's averaging 16.6 rebound chances in those games. But I think one thing that maybe makes this difficult is we've seen massive rebound games from Shea Gilgis-Alexander. So if I don't, if I like SGA's rebound line, I probably don't like Chet's because I don't think they can both cover it in the, in the same game. So yeah, I probably lean to the over, but I'm not going to take that down. The, S, the SGA one makes the most sense to me. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. The SGA one makes the most sense to me, which means common sense. We've got to throw out the window. Fucking reverse engineer this shit. <laughs> Let's take Chet's rebounds. Like SGA has smashed his rebound line in the last two games. Chet has not in the last two games. Chess rebound line is still much higher than SGA's. Do we just fade all common sense thinking here and bet Chet's over in his rebounds? Is that what we're doing now? Is that what we're about? I think I'm going to do it. We'll see. I've got his rebounds down as a lean. Uh, let's get to J-Dub, Jalen Williams, see what's cooking with him. All right, so his points line, 19 and a half. And he's cash this in four out of his last 10 games. So far in this series, 18 and 20 points. So the line is pretty much in the middle of that, 19 and a half. Um, in head-to-head matchups, he's cashing three out of his last nine of Dallas. Last two games, 36, 38 minutes. Field goal attempts, 15 and 17. Only shooting 40 and 41% from the field. So his percentage is not great. In the past, looking at the road games in Dallas, has had one good game in Dallas before. So let's not read too much into that. Three-pointers, he's actually shooting decently from downtown, 40% and 50% in the two games. Free throws, taking a couple of free throws as well, but I think it's he's stuck at the rim, which making it difficult, and even those middies doesn't seem to have those falling. So, yeah, I've got no lean to the over or the under for Jalen Williams. So let's jump into the next one. Assists, lines at four and a half. So he's had five and four assists in the two games this series, four out of his last nine games against Dallas. Potential assists, eight and nine potentialists in the two games so far. So eight and a half as an average. If we need to get five assists, I'd like to see more potential assists than that. So I'd probably lean to the under, but we're not too much confidence, right? He's getting very close to that line. So yeah, I'm not willing to dance with that. Rebounds, four and a half is the line. Fuck me dead, this guy. Just, he's so consistently close to this all the time on all three props. Five 
rebounds in game one, four rebounds in game two. He had 10 rebound chances in that second game and only finished with the four boards. He's covered this rebound line in two out of his last nine games against Dallas. So his average against Dallas is only 3.3. So if you factor that in, you can probably lean to the under. But in the past, he's played a lot less minutes. So in the games where he's played at least 35 minutes, there's four games here. And he's gotten four plus rebounds in all of them, and he's got five plus in two. So I think that line is just about right, to be honest. I'm not dancing with that. So Jalen Williams, I've got no looks on you, my friend. Uh, who else we got? We got to look at Aaron Wiggins. Now, this is one of the guys that's just been banging off the bench. Let's check out his points prop. He's been making it happen. I'm getting Obi Toppin vibes right here. So Aaron Wiggins, his points line is at six and a half. He's cashed this in both games this series, 16 points in game one, nine points in game two. If we look at the series against the Pelicans, he went under in all four games. But I think his line was lower than six and a half. So he was actually covering his actual points line very well throughout this playoffs. Lines moved up a little bit, so he's yet, he's not there. Might get tw uh, 20 minutes in this game. Not overly aroused by this, to be honest. Could have a big game, but. Yeah, I'm not really feeling the Aaron Wiggins play. Who else do we have in this thing? We've got Lou Dort. No one bets on Lou Dort, do they? Let's have a look at Josh Giddy. So, Josh Giddy. His points line is six and a half. In the two games, two points and eight points. There was tremendous value on fading Josh Giddy the start of this series. But check out his minutes. 17 minutes in game one, 11 minutes in game two. Um, four and spill goal attempts, zero from two from three. So, yeah, I think the value is gone taking the under six and a half. It could be really dependent on minutes, but you don't know how many minutes he's going to get 10, 15, or 20. It's not a great matchup for him, so that might keep him off the floor. But these lines are, are very, very low. So, his assist line is at two and a half, two assists in game one, assist in game two. And then his rebound line, three and a half. So his rebound line was five and a half in that, that last game, um, only finishing with two boards. And I know that because I had a strong lean, but that's moved down to three and a half. So all the value on Josh Giddy unders are gone. So if Josh Giddy getting less minutes, who's getting more? Um, we saw this Jalen Williams. Now, I had a lean for him to hit three pointers in this game. And he hit one in the first quarter, I believe. But looking at his points prop, four and a half. Look at this. 11 and 8 points in the first two games. He's been very productive off the bench. He's covered this in seven of his last 10. He's hit this in three straight games against Dallas, four out of his last six against Dallas. So his minutes aren't very high at all. Um, but if he's he took seven and then six shots in those last two games, made a three, one three-pointer in game one, two three in game two. Now they are on the road. These young boys can struggle on the road, but... Man, for four and a half points for this guy, surely, right? Seven out of his last 10. He's only hit on 47% of the season. What was his minutes at? Let me check this. 16 and 14 minutes. So if we just say ten between 10 and 17 minutes, let's filter that shit out for the season. Ten Between 10 and 17. He's played 42 games between 10 and 17 minutes, and he's covered this line at a 48% hit rate. Head-to-head, -head, he's played that many minutes against Dallas in five games, and he's covered this four out of the five games, including the last two. So I don't want to overreact to that. Seven and six on the road for the first time. Yeah, I don't have a good feeling about it. And again, I'm not going to bet it just because it's hit in the last two games, right? We ain't doing that shit no more. I've had enough of it. Fucking Obi Toppin. East Bay Duncan motherfucker, Obi Toppin. God. All right, let's jump into Dallas. Let's see what the hell's cooking over here. We've got Luka Doncic. So a player that's been hitting every single time is Luka over in the first quarter, Kyrie under in the first quarter. I bet the Kyrie under in the first quarter last time in a cash, but let's have a look at Luka's seven and a half, nine out of his last 10 games he's cashed this on, averaging 11.5 points per game. In head-to-head -head matches, he's covered this in six consecutive games against OKC. I think it's with total total points is where we tend to see the biggest shift from game to game. These first quarter ones just be banging so well. Checking the odds on my sportsbook to see whether this is worth taking. 
So the seven and a half at a dollar seventy six. Kyrie's under. It's not five and a half anymore. It's moved to four and a half on my book, but I get pretty good odds for it. I think I might just run the Luca Kyrie parlay. To be honest, it's just working so well. Kyrie under four and a half. Luca over seven and a half. Why not? Let's dance. All right, let's look at Luca's points. Thirty and a half. That line keeps dropping. So Luca. First two games against OKC, 19 and then 29 points. That knee be mucking around with him. We know that, right? 40.8, 41.2, 19 and 21 shots attempted. Did hit in 52% of his shots in that last game, but a lot of that damage was done in the first quarter. Looking at his three-pointers, he was five from eight from deep in that last game, one from eight in that first game. Only got to the free throw line for two attempts in that last one. So not ultra aggressive getting to the line there for Luca. I would say my thought on this is I would lean to the over, but my concern is that injury, right? And Luca is probably a little bit different to most players where if he's injured, he makes it very obvious to everybody that he's in, <laughs> he's feeling it. So he pushes through, don't get me wrong, but he yeah makes it very obvious and that doesn't breed much confidence. So I don't want to make any bets on Luca's points, but I do lean to the over if you're interested. Assist-wise, the line's at nine and a half. He's covered this in two of six games against OKC. So far this series, nine and seven assists. Now, this is still pretty juiced. Minus 135, and he hasn't even gone over it in the last two. Looking at potential assists, 20 potential assists in the first game, only 15 potential assists in that last one. Minutes are definitely there for him. But, but yeah, so what, what you'll see here is the under is plus money, and the under has cash in three straight. The under has cash in both games so far in this series. But the books are clearly uh, have the over as the favorite. If we look at the last 10, what do we see? Four of his last 10 games. If we check his home games, maybe he's got a better rate there. Five of his last 10 games at home, he's gone over. So, yeah, I can't get a lean on Luca here. The data obviously says to favor the under. The sports book is favoring the over. The data hasn't been working. So, yeah, I think that means he's going to go over, right? But the odds are shit for the over. So don't play it. That's what I'm going to do. Now, looking at his rebound line, nine and a half plus 100. Now, he had six rebounds in game one, 10 rebounds in game two, potential rebound chances, 14 and 15 rebound chances in both games. So the rebound chances were very similar. He just had a lot more success in that last one. But at the same time, 14 and 15 rebound chances are a lot lower than what he normally does. We just look at the season. Luca averages, oh, he's only averaging 14.1 rebound chances per game, but that's in order to collect 9.1 rebounds. So looking at the head-to-head stuff, he's had 20, 15, 20 rebound chances, in the, and that's where he nailed the boards. Yeah, I can't get a lean on this either. So much uncertainty right now, and that comes with losing. What else? Who else can we look at? Let's look at Kyrie. So Kyrie broke a lot of hearts. There were a lot of people, me me included, expecting him to bounce back scoring. But then OKC did a pretty good job defending him. They're not giving him the types of looks that he likes and forced him to pass, and he passed them on defense. So I think his steals plus blocks prop could be a good look. I think he's been hitting that quite well. I'm going to take his first quarter unders. You already know that. I'll just take the multi, uh, the parlay. Kyrie under, Luca over. I don't give a fuck anymore. Let's do it. His point sign, though, is at 22 and a half. In the two games so far, 20 points and nine points. Despite that, line still set at 22 and a half because he's, historically we know that Kyrie can get a pop, and you know what I mean? In the two games he played OKC in the regular season, 25 and 36 points for Kyrie against OKC. So more than capable. If we look at his field goal attempts, only 14 attempts in game one, only eight attempts in game two. He was two from eight. Uh, three pointers. He didn't seek a three pointer in that last game. Zero from two. He made five of six free throws. And a lot of his points, really, they, in the tech fouls, Kyrie's your man. He's the one stepping up. So if the if Dallas had lost game two, if Dallas had lost game two, and Kyrie had this num this start line where he took eight shots and he only scored nine points, then yeah, I'd be backing the over for sure the next game. One, Dallas won that game, and Kyrie didn't have to score that much. I'm just thinking about what types of adjustments does OKC make? PJ Washington, an under could be a good look for him just because I know how he is, but he is also quite streaky. But let's just talk about Kyrie real quick. Points, I can't get with it. I can't get with it. 
Now, assist, though. Assist, assist, assist. Now, he's covered his assist line in three or four games against OKC. Three assists in game one, then 11 assists in game two. In that game, he had 20 potential assists, which is wild. So the question is, how many potential is Kyrie going to get in this next one? Because that's going to indicate whether he gets it. And OKC, I don't believe, will make too many changes with how they defend Kyrie. Because, again, the way that they defended him stopped him from scoring. Job done. But... He did create a lot for others. That's a lot of potential assists. And with Luka Doncic still somewhat banged up, you would expect Kyrie's usage rate to be up. So the over five and a half here is plus money. I can talk myself into this one. Over five and a half is plus money. We know that Dallas are at home. At home, you would expect some of their role guys to shoot better. OKC's defense may not change too much, which means they might leave PJ Washington, your Josh Greens, Derek Jones Jr. Leave these guys wide open as long as we're stopping Kyrie and Luca. Chance. So I think that's where the assist prop for Kyrie comes in. I don't think that's a bad look. So that's one that I'm going to look at. Rebound wise, four and a half is the line. Now, in the first series against the Clippers, the rebounds for Kyrie was the wave. A lot of people were looking at that. So far against OKC, hasn't got it happening. One and three rebounds, five and nine rebound chances. So they haven't been very high in head to head matchups. He's cashing only one of four games. And again, the rebound chances aren't very high. 7.8 rebounds, and he needs to get five boards. The data the data tells me to look at the under. But it looks like the books are split. Plus 102 for the over, minus 105. So the under is favored, but only slightly. So the under makes the most sense. But because it makes sense, I'm just not going to touch it because... Shit be wilding right now. All right. So Kyrie assists is probably what I'm going to look at. It's not because of that last... You know, it kind of is because of that last game, but not because he got 11. It's how he got the 11 that I'm more con- focused on. Uh, who else do we have here? Where's D. Gaff? Daniel Gafford. So, look, given... I'm going to assume here that his finger is still somewhat fucked up. I'm not going to take a bet here because he was struggling to hold that ball. But his line's at 11 and a half. His cash is in three straight. 16 in game one. 13 in game two, um, 27 minutes in both games, shot attempts, 12 in game one, six in game two. That second game, he did get to the free throw line a lot. Only shot 56% from the field, though. So Daniel Gafford, to score this many points, do we think he can do it again? Well, let's just have a look at games where he plays at least 25 minutes on the regular season. Because, Well, look, head-to-head, yeah, he's had a bit of success against OKC, but he is trending down. In games where Daniel Gafford plays at least 25 minutes, because that's what he's getting so far in this playoff series, on the season, he's actually covered this line in 21 of 38 games. So the hit rate honestly isn't too bad. But for me, I am thinking, if I'm not going to bet this play. Could be a popular player on the board, but I think his finger's all fucked up. I, I would honestly lean to the under for Daniel Gafford, despite the amazing hit rate against OKC. Trending down so far in this playoffs, and he should be sitting around 10 points per game. So the 11.5, I would lean to the under. I'm not going to bet it because I'm pussy. Or am I? Maybe I will bet it. (laughs) Under 11.5 points for Daniel Gafford. He's gone over it in four straight games against OKC. The line hasn't moved too much. It's gone up by, I think, one point. It was 10.5 in the last game. It's moved up to 11 and a half. Am I crazy? I might be, but surely they can't leave this guy to dunk all over him again. Maybe I am crazy. I'm looking at the under. Fuck the over. I don't care how often you've hit this line. I'm not taking it. Uh, rebounds, seven and a half boards is the line. He's cashed this in one of 10 games against uh, in his last 10. Sorry, In head-to-head matchups, he's cashed this in three out of his last four. So the very last game was the first time he went under this rebound line of seven and a half, finishing with seven. Um, so he's been very good. And this is a play, if you look at his points and rebounds, I think that's a play that everybody might be looking at. But 19 and a half is the line now. He barely covered that in that last game. It was an absolute sweat and a half. Um, does look he, look, he does play better at home as well, which is the scary thing. He could be an absolute beast. Let me just double check the season stuff. So on the season, he's averaging 18.06 points plus rebounds. Actually, let's just look at the last 20 games because he was traded mid-season. 
Over his last 20 games, he's averaging 15.7 points plus rebounds. Games at home, 18.2 points and rebounds. So, definitely sees an uplift at home. Shit. I'm just not going to bet it. But I want you all to know, I am leaning the under on his points and rebounds. That's where I think he goes, just because the over seems too obvious, right? I'd normally look at the over because all the numbers look so good, but those numbers are ass. So let's lean to the end. I don't think I'm, I'm not going to bet it, but that's definitely where I'm leaning. So I'm going to track these leans that I land on. We'll reassess. And if we have a winning day, we might have just solved the NBA playoffs, ladies and gentlemen. That's D Gaff. Who else do we have? We got PJ Washington. How can we forget? So my casual take on this is to bet the under. Whatever it is, is to bet the under because he was amazing in that last game. Amazing. So his line's at 13 and a half. He had 10 points in game one, 29 points in game two. Um, but I only played 25 minutes in that first game, played 40 minutes in the last game, took 18 shots. At one point, he had taken more shots than Luka Doncic, but fair enough. you got to feed the hot hand. Seven from 11 from deep. Um, 13 and a half is not very high, though. They haven't moved it too high. But looking at his three-point line, it's at two and a half. Plus money for him to make two and a half. But this man be streaking. If he gets the minutes, he's going to get the opportunities, though. That's my concern. So, yeah, I'm not brave enough to bet it. But I do lean to the under. The under is cash in seven of his last 10 games. So that 29 points is a massive outlier. It's not what he normally does. Um, he had a big rebounding game too, I believe. Yeah, 11 boards. And that's a complete outlier as well. He's normally sitting at six and a half. What about his assists? One and a half. He had four assists in that last game. Still so was an absolute monster, PJ Washington. He was a beast. So look, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of taking the PRA, but taking the under. The under has cash in 59% of games of this season. It's cash in eight out of his last 10 and he's coming off an absolute monster of a game. 29 points, 11 boards, and 4 assists. Minus 102 for the under. The under has cash in 3 out of 4 games against OKC as well. So we might see that this line move a little bit too far. Um, so, yeah. that So the under makes a lot of sense to me. That's what I'm talking about. But again, I don't think that's a play that most people will take. So I think that freezes from the public, the public vote. Because if everyone's on the public vote on the same bet, it doesn't work most of the time. Let's have a look at Tim Hardaway. So Tim Hardaway's great. I said in the Discord, I think Tim Hardaway is due for a sneaky game here, and he went crazy, 17 points. So his line in this one is 8.5. His line in the last game, FYI, was 5.5. And, and I don't know that. It was one of the bets I had. But 8.5 for him. He played only 18 minutes. It felt like he was out there for a lot longer. 17 points in 18 minutes is crazy. In the first game, 17 minutes, but he only scored two points. He was one from five. He didn't shoot well, so he bounced back. That's what you're looking for. That's what a bounce back looks like. I wouldn't worry about the increase in his attempts. That comes from starting off hot. You keep feeding it, right? He was zero from four in that first game, came back and shot two from four. So this line at eight and a half, similar to PJ Washington, it's one that I'd probably lean to the under on, but it is too low a line for me to fuck around with. His assists and rebounds. Those those props aren't juicy. So for Tim Hardaway, I know he had a great game in that last game. I'm not man enough to bet the over in that. We do have Derek Jones Jr. He didn't show up in the injury report, but um, it looked like he was somewhat injured in that last game, but he kept pushing through. So his points line is at eight and a half. So far in this series, seven and nine points in those two games, 29 and 28 minutes. The so field goals, he took 12 shots in that last game, which is very promising. And because they're leaving him wide open. He was three from five in the first Three from 12 in that last game, and he scored nine points. One from three from deep in game one, then one from five in game two. So this is a play where I see some upside, and it's Derek Jones Jr. So eight and a half points might be something I can muck around with. Three-point line over one and a half is minus 225. For him to make two three-pointers, plus 195. So the volume in that last game is somewhat promising. He was one from five. Last time he did that, though, he came back and didn't shoot a three-pointer at all. So he probably gets spooked. He could score in other ways. I think the Derrick Jones points prop could be good here. Cashed it quite well against the Clippers. Uh, he's going to get some minutes here because he's the main defender on Shea Gildas-Alexander. 
if they do run, I remember uh, I don't know who it was, but I remember someone was saying that Dallas need to play faster on offense, so OKC can't set up their defense. And if they do run transition, Derek Jones Jr. is the guy that's going to benefit the most from them. So that makes a lot of sense to me. It's not one of those guys that hits it on a consistent basis, so we take it. So seven and nine in the first two games. The first game, he didn't shoot much at all. The second game, he shot a lot more, which is promising, and he didn't shoot well. So line set at eight and a half. If we can get a similar type of volume, even if we see a regression in his volume, if we see him shooting back at 50% where he normally is, this is definitely a line that he can cover. So I think that's a good one. Look at his rebounds. So I had a lean for his rebounds to go under, and he went over. And I think someone put that in the comment section as well. And that's because he just, the, I think the reason was because he goes up and down, up and down. So does that mean that this is an underplay? Seven potential rebounds in that last game. Yeah, it probably could be, but that's not a reason for me to take the bet for Derek Jones Jr. And just checking to see if there's anybody else. I think someone who's been quiet, who could have one good game in this series is Derek Lively. So Derek Lively, though, he is struggling against Chet. So they're both rangy centers with not much strength. But his line's at five and a half. He's only scored two points in both games. That last game, he had 20 minutes. Oh, he's been shooting terrible. One from three in game one, and then one out of seven in game two. So missing some bunnies. And this is a guy that only shoots near the rim. So that could be an interesting one. If he's getting seven shot attempts, thank you, outlier. He's exceeded five and a half points in six straight games at home. Let's filter out the home stuff real quick with D-Live. Yes, he has. Six straight games at home. He's cashed his points line. So Derek Lively, that could be something juicy. And it really bucks the trend, right? Normally, if you see some, well, not me, but normally for some people, it's like, ah, oh, can't score against OKC. Line's at five and a half. Let's take the under. Now, the over is at minus 140, though. So I don't love that for Derek Lively. I don't love it at all. But let me check to see what, what odds I'm getting on my little book here. D Love. And there's no market for him, so I can't even bet that anyway. But let's take that as a lean. The over could be a good look. His rebound line at five and a half. He had four rebounds in both games. Nine and seven rebound chances. If you get to those types of rebound chances, he can't go over the six. So, but again, I lean to the over. Points and rebounds for D Live. 11 and a half is what we're looking at in this game. He's only averaging six so far in this series. It doesn't make sense to me, but I swear I think this is going to happen. I don't have the market available in my sportsbook at the moment, but I'm going to put that down as a lean just so I can track it because if we're on the money, then we could still have a profitable future here. Uh, let's jump into the next game, shall we? Pump on the brakes real quick. I've got another announcement or just something I really want to say to you, the person who is listening to this. These playoffs have been rough as hell. Now, I don't want to abandon it altogether because this shit is fun for me. I can't wait to figure out how to make this happen, but it has been difficult. What that means is I want to do a bit more research, not into player props, but really how people are getting it done. Now, from a lot of the people that I watch on YouTube, what I follow on Twitter, Discord groups, whatever, it feels like we're all struggling out there. Now, I know one person who is doing quite well in these playoffs, um, and I have been chatting to him about strategy and what he's doing at the moment, but I need more full betters, cappers to really look at to see what's going on there. So I need your help. I want you to put comments down in the video description for any YouTubers, cappers, Twitter accounts, whoever it is. I need you to put some insights as who is doing well right now so I can research the hell out of what they're doing and possibly even reach out to them to help us with this type of bullshit because you know I'm not slacking off you. I'm trying it. Hitting. I ain't good at this right now. But Damn, I'm determined to make it happen. So let me know. Put it in the video, not the video description, put it in the comment section. Who is killing it right now? Because I'm not going to, I don't want to feel like this no more. So let me know. Help a brother out. Let's get back to the preview. Let's go. All right. We're looking at the Boston Celtics versus the Cleveland Cavaliers. This series is tied 1-1. Cavs, um, Cleveland dropping a game at home. Very similar to what they did in the, in the Miami series. Uh, apologies if I'm not looking at the camera right now. I'm just checking to see what the line and total points are at. So the Celtics are eight and a half point favorites. Totals, we're looking at 211.5. But let's get through it then, shall we? Uh, let's go with uh, Boston first. Difficult team to bet on. Um, Jason Tatum, we'll start there. So his unders in his points prop was the key play that everyone was banking on. He actually played really well in that last game. 
but then he got, they got blown out and he ended up sucking. So started off well, didn't cash. So his points line in this game, 27 and a half. He has gone under in nine out of his last 10 games. And if we look at how he's played against Cleveland, he's gone under in five straight games as well. Now, this is someone uh, I would normally, to be honest, what I would say is I don't want to bet on this because his line's at 27 and a half. He's capable of much more than that. On the season, he's hit this at a 40% rate. Backs up against the wall. He should do better. If we think about how he went in Miami, though. So against Miami, 23 points in a blowout win. Then Miami won by 10 points. And that was the game where Jason Tatum scored 28. The next game, Boston got revenge. They won by 20 points, but Tatum only scored 22. And I feel like if this team is to win, I wonder if there's a stat out there. When Jason Tatum scores 28 points, how many games do they win? Let me fucking check that out right now. I'm sure I could get that on Stats Muse, right? All right, so I've just looked it up. Jason Tatum, I think he scored 28 points or more in 31 games this season. From those 31 games, the Celtics won 25 of those. So 25 and 6 when Jason Tatum scores 28 points or more. That actually doesn't help me at all make a decision on whether he covers this line or not. So, yeah, I'm uncertain. The numbers say that he can't do it. We know in terms of potential, he can do it, and he has reason to. No Paul Zingas. He should score over, right? So I'm just going to choose not to play it. Um, yeah, we can put it as a lean that I think he scores the over and bucks the trend here. But if he goes under, I wouldn't be surprised either because he sucks right now. Two up percentage is just poor. That's all it is. He's just not making enough shots. Taking a lot, but not making them. So I'm going to pass on that. His assist prop, five and a half for Tatum. Had six in the last game, five in the first game. Head-to-head -head against Cleveland. He's cashed this in three out of his last eight. Looking at the potentials here, potential assists aren't very high. Still managed to get six in that last one. You're getting plus money for it here. But the under is the favorite for this, minus 142. So I'm not willing to bet that or against it. His rebound line is back up at nine and a half. The whole world was backing Jason Tatum to get 10 rebounds in that last game. Only finish on seven. 13 rebound chances. He started off quite well, but that second half was ass. Once Cleveland started to pull away, then those rebound chances didn't come. So if we think about the game script, I'm thinking Cleveland do uh, win this one. They're eight and a half point favorites. It should be a somewhat closer game. I don't know if they run a train through Cleveland, but... Boston are winning, then there's more rebound chances available for Jason Tatum. Let's just say that. Now, if we look at the head-to-head -head numbers, he's covered this in six out of eight games against Cleveland. The first, this game here, 2022, where he had seven rebounds, Cleveland won that game. Cleveland won this game, but it was close, so minutes would have been impacted. Boston won that. Boston. Boston. Cleveland won this in a close one. And then this one, Boston won, got rebounds in that last game, got blown out. So it looks like if Cleveland are having a great offensive game, that's going to limit Jason Tatum's ability to get boards. And do we expect Cleveland to have a good offensive game? Potentially not. I'm just going to check the what's the line Cleveland in this game, their, their points line. 101. So the line for Cleveland is 101.5 points. So in this particular game, they scored 118. He didn't get boards. This game, they scored 132. So he couldn't get boards. So we're expecting the Boston defense to be better and to aim up in this game. And if it does, these rebounds are cash money. So just because he fucked us in the last game, I'm not afraid to look at it. Jason Tatum rebounds. We're going back to the well. Because the research was sound last time, it was just the game script was unpredictable. So given that the research is still sound, I don't think it changes. The script of the game shouldn't be the same. So, yeah, Jason Tatum rebounds. We're running it back with him. We then have Jalen Brown. So Jalen Brown, I think a lot of people bet on his first quarter points prop. If you got it at six and a half, you lost. If you got it at five and a half, you won. But let's take a look. His point signs at 23 and a half, four out of his last 10, five out of his last nine against Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland were weak at defending th uh, small forwards on the season. They allowed a lot of points to them. Brown had 32 points in that first game. Second game, he only played 31 minutes. Still took 17 shots, but didn't shoot very well at all. Zero from six from downtown. So this is the type of guy that I can see bouncing back. Jalen Brown. I'm not going to overanalyze the numbers because we know those those numbers be playing tricks, you know? So... I think capability here, Jalen Brown, 23 and a half points. I know he's on the road, 
but I'm not overly concerned about that. He's got to have a bounce back. He's got to play more minutes. I think he's capable of taking more shots. He's definitely capable of making more threes, at least two of them, right? 31%. I think if he can make two more, that takes him up to 25. So 25 points. Hell yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Rebounds for Dalen Brown. the line. He's gone under in two straight games, or actually five straight games against Cleveland. But in this series, six and four, 10 and eight rebound chances. Under is definitely the favorite, and so it should be. So I feel like this line is sharp. It's where it needs to be. So I'd lean to the under, but at minus 130, not a great play. But if you're on fantasy apps, go for your life. Assists, two and a half assists. He had been covering this extremely well against Cleveland. Last two, hasn't made it happen. Seven and five potential assists. Tough to get assists when your teammates can't shoot to save their lives. But this is one where I'd probably lean to the over. We need three assists. In a game where you need three assists for Jalen Brown, you'd really be looking at six to seven potential assists, and he's averaging six potential assists in the first two games so far. So, yeah, on the assist side of things, I'd lean to the over on that. Points and assists could be a play here. 26 and a half, so that's actually three more by adding them together. No, 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 we ain't doing that. So the points, I like the over. The assists, I like the, the unders, the most likely play by the looks of it. Six and a half, you know. So we could have a same game parlay here for Jalen Brown. Over in points, over in assists, under in rebounds, potentially. Let's see where I land with this. Jalen Brown. Who else have we got? Where's that bald bastard, Derek White? Making people that look like us look bad, Mr. White. He sucked in that last game, and I know a lot of people were betting on him. So his points prop in this one. 16 and a half for Derek White, um, 25 in game one, 10 points in game two, 30 minutes. He was three from 11, so the volume was off. One from eight from downtown, so he sucked there. So the bounce back could be a factor here for Derek White, but he's not one of their primary options. And if he doesn't have it going, I don't necessarily see him just bouncing back immediately. So he's someone who can probably continue on this trend. Well, not continue, but to still go under. Um, just checking to see. Head-to-head -head numbers, because he's gone under this in seven out of nine games against Cleveland, even throughout this regular season. No, Chris Stapps could change things a little bit, but yeah, Derek White, 16 and a half. I, yeah, I don't think the bounce back factor is strong for Derek White, not being a primary option, not an essential thing for him to do. Uh, for someone like Derek White, his defense needs to be better. They get Garland and, and Mitchell cooking him. I think that's where the change needs to be. His assist, three and a half. So he's covered this in three straight games against Cleveland. Uh, I actually leaned on him to go under his assist prop. And the reason why was these potential assists. But in that last game, he actually had 10 potential assists, which is a lot higher than he normally gets against Cleveland. So now in this series, he's averaging about eight and a half potential assists per game. So for him to get four, yeah, if he's going to get those types of numbers. Juice to the gills. So if you're in the fantasy props, over three and a half could be a play for you. Not one for me. Rebounds, lines at three and a half. Juice to the gills as well. One in the game one, and then four rebounds in that last game. Doubled his rebound chances. But yeah, these odds, not liking Derek White for any bets whatsoever. We also have Drew Holiday. So what's Drew Holiday been doing? Three out of his last 10. 8.8 .8 as an average. Uh, so far in this series, 14 in game one, four points in game two, 35 minutes in both games. So in that game, he took half the amount of shots and he shot 29% from the field, zero from two from three. So could Drew Holiday be someone who bounces back? I think so. Because you can see here that the four points is a massive outlier. The 11 and a half line seems about right. He had been cash. He's cashed this quite three out of his last five games against Cleveland. He had a lot of regression, like most players, but prior to this, he'd been doing okay. So the 11.5 for Drew Holiday, I think, yeah, the over makes the most sense on him bouncing back to what he normally does against them. Uh, I wonder what the numbers look like without Porzingis. So, no, the only time he's played them without Porzingis has been this playoff series. Last 10 without Chris Stubbs, averaging 10.8. I wonder if we just check to see. He's had games where he struggled, has bounced back, but not high enough. So I think that line is just about right for Drew Holiday, to be honest. This is assist prop, three and a half. 
Minus 139 to the over, and he's gone under in both games so far. Two and three assists. Two assists in game one, but he had nine po- two. He had nine potential assists in that game and only managed to get three. And that really comes down to Boston not shooting well. So I can see the Celtics shooting better in this one, surely, which means Drew Holiday assists could be on the cards here. Now, it is favored by the books at minus 139. So this is another one, your daily see fantasy motherfuckers. Over three and a half assists could be a good look. As a straight bet, I don't necessarily love it. Let me see what types of odds I can get for it. Four assists for Drew Holiday. Yeah, it's very similar. I got minus 134, so not that much better. Rebounds, four and a half the line. Again, minus 136. Only had two rebounds in the last one. Six rebounds in the game prior. Head-to-head numbers. Yeah, he's only connected in one of five. Rebound chances. He had eight rebound chances in that game where he went over. Looking at his last 10, he's hit this with less rebound chances, though. 7.3 rebound chances. He's made it happen. Against Cleveland, it hasn't been great. So, yeah, probably lean to the under, Drew Holiday. He's probably going to be defending on the ball a lot, as well as Derek White, so that might limit his chances. So the under at plus money could be a good look, but, yeah, it's just not sitting right with me. All right, who the hell else have we got in this game? Peyton Pritchard off the bench. So we did find success betting his points plus assists in that last game, and that was a game where it didn't even go the way we expected it to go. Really, he only got 19 minutes, and that's because the the blowout, really. So I expected him to get at least 25 in that game. He finished on 13 points, 4 assists. Game 1 had 16 points and 2 assists. He even got a lot of rebounds, too. So just the volume is good. He comes on aggressive, not afraid to take shots. So I think the points plus assists could be a good lookie for Peyton Pritchard. Worked for us last time. He's not a garbage time only type of guy. He's solidified in that rotation. So Peyton Pritchard, he should still get the 20 to 25 minutes. He should still take a lot of shots, get some assists as well. And the Celtics are expected to be better. And if the Celtics are going to be better, someone like Peyton Pritchard has to cash. So um, I think that's one that we can continue the ride and not expect a dramatic fall off. Checking his numbers against Cleveland in the past, he got much less minutes. So... Yeah, in this new part of the rotation where he's getting the minutes, I think his points plus assists could still be a good option. Now, one thing I wanted to look at was Luke Cornett rebound. So this was one of the really popular players um, that everyone was getting around in that last game. So I don't have a line for just his rebounds, though. Rebounds plus assists could be a good look. But I think his rebound line, if his rebound line's at four and a half, I think the over for his rebounds could be a good look. So I don't available for me at the moment, but just because it it didn't land for us last time, I'm telling you, all these bets that lose, if you back it again, there's a lot of there might be a good chance for a bounce back here, is all I'm saying. Who else have we got? Old Al Horford. So one of the leans I had was under in his PRA, it was 20 and a half, but I was worried starting more minutes, whatever. But let's have a look. His points line eight and a half. He had eleven in that game, seven in the first one, twenty-eight points. He came out shooting really well, four from nine, made three three three-pointers. Head-to-head matchups against Cleveland. Had some success in the past, but he is a different man now. Rebound-wise, I think he sucked in that last game. Yep, two boards, eight rebounds in the first one. So if we look at the PRA, if it's at 20 and a half, we could look at the under. Mm, It's at 19 and a half, so it's come down a little bit. So 19 in the first game, 14 in the second. He's expected to bounce back and be a little bit better, but can he get 20 PRA is the question. If you look at his last 10, he clearly hasn't. hasn't. If you look at his last 20, he's cashed in six of his last 20 games. But last 10. Uh, so he's gone under this every game of the playoffs. Minutes without Porzingis, which are these last few games, haven't necessarily been huge. So if he gets about 28 to 30 minutes, I think he probably still goes to the under, to be honest. That makes the most sense to me. The under in his PRA, it's plus money. Let's buck around and find out, shall we? Because I did think he could go under in that last game. All right. Let's take a look at these Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, we've got Donovan Mitchell at home. So his point sign in the last game is 29.5. It is still at 29.5. So in this series, 33 and 29 points. That last game, he started off so slow. A lot of this damage was done in the second half. He still only finished the game with 19 shot attempts. 
I think there's room for him to improve. He's not afraid to take 20 to 25 shots. He did shoot five from seven, though, so very efficient game. And if we look at his free throws, he got to the line four times. So if we just look at Orlando as a good baseline, his home games against Orlando, 30, 23, 28, and then 39 points. So I think at home, definitely steps it up a little bit. This is his games against Boston, five out of his last eight games. If we go home games only, 25 and 40 points. So I think the line, honestly, is pretty sharp at 29 and a half. Oh, I would even say it's a little bit high, but I still think the over could be the look here for Donovan Mitchell. I think one player I can look at, though, is his points prop, seven and a half. So I took that in the last game, and, he, and it didn't come off for me. He only finished with two. but. I'm all over the over here. I had a good read on that last time. Evan Mobley went crazy, which nobody saw coming. Karis Levert was great off the first quarter. So I think D. Mitch is going to go back to being that man. You can see here, if you look at, if we look at his last 20, 20 games, he had a shit period here. Where's the playoff start, though? Last 10. So the playoff started here against Orlando. Hasn't put, to, hasn't put back-to-back poor first quarters playoffs. Ride that trend. Now, if we look at his assist prop... Five and a half is the line. He had eight assists in that line. Five in the first game, eight in the second. Potential assists, not super high, but his men were stroking and Evan Mobley was shooting quite well. I don't really like the assist prop here for D. Mitch, five and a half. The hit rate is not excellent, and it's not like he's necessarily bouncing back. You'd be expecting something consistent to occur. And what do you need for that to happen? You probably need Evan Mobley to have a great game. You need Isaac Okoro to get some fast break layups, Karis LeVert. So, and I think that's what's required in order for Donovan Mitchell to cash his assist line. Looking at his rebounds, though, five and a half. He has cashed this in both games, six and seven boards. 11 rebound chances in that last one, 13 in the first game. So the rebounds could be a good look here for Donovan Mitchell, but five and a half, I don't think I could entertain that. He hit this at a 41% rate on the season, head-to-head against Boston. He has covered this in five straight games, though. That's what I'm talking about, consistency. Now, the thing with consistency is that it fucking fools you into betting on it. So I'm not saying to bet the under. I'm just not sure if I can take this because it keeps happening like some other ones. What was his rebound numbers against Orlando at home? Two, eight, six, and then nine. So it does get better at home, believe it or not. It does in the playoffs. So his last three games at home in the playoffs, he's gone over this rebound line. Regular season, not too much. Head-to-head, home games, one from two. So a lot of these games were on the road and he rebounded well. He actually didn't play in the home games against Boston this season, believe it or not. They were all road games that Donovan Mitchell played on. Yeah, so I think rebounds could be a good look here for Donovan Mitchell. That makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. Okay. That's on the list. Who else we got? Darius Garland. Now, I had his unders in assists as a as a really strong lean in that last one, and I, I talked myself out of it. I didn't take it. So his points prop at 15 and a half. He's in both games against Boston. Prior to that, though, he was a beast against Boston. Got it done in six consecutive games. Then the playoffs happened, and he scored 14 points in both of them. His minutes in the playoffs are actually down on his normal minutes against Boston. Field goal attempts are down. Three-pointers made. He had a pretty strong shooting night in the last game, but he didn't take that many shots, and he doesn't get to the free throw line very well. So, yeah, I think it's going to be close, but, yeah, I can see why he's trending down because the volume is not there. Assists, five and a half. So he's gone under in both games against Boston. Potential assists seem to be dropping 10 and 8 potential assists. Donovan Mitchell is just doing more and more and more. So I feel like the same is going to happen. Five and a half, minus 105. The under is minus 115. So this play is yeah somewhat juiced, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I would lean to the under in this. Not because of just what's happened in the last two. Potential assists are down. Donovan Mitchell's potential assist numbers are up. Darius Garland is really playing off the ball a lot. So he's not necessarily creating. I can see it in the games that he's looking to score more. And he's now, it's happened throughout this whole playoffs. Look at his potential assists 9.3 in his last 10 games. He's averaging 5.1 assists in his last 10. So the trend there is definitely towards the under. 
regardless if it's against Orlando or against Boston, but that's purely because of the way the Cavs are playing. Mitchell doing a lot of heavy lifting right now. So I might continue to back the under there for Darius Garland. I just got to make sure I'm not a bitch. Don't be a bitch and take the bet. Stop talking yourself out of stuff. Come on. Now, Evan Mobley, shit. One thing I didn't check, is Jared Allen playing this game? Is a game time decision. Game time decision. But from all accounts, he's still fried. Points for Evan Mobley, 15 and a half. He's cashed this in both games against Boston, 17 and 21. Uh, I was very close to taking his over in that last game. I said it that he is a Kmart version of Bam Adebayo. Kmart is like Walmart for the. And Bam Adebayo had a great series against Boston, especially with Kristaps Porzingis. A little bit vulnerable to bigs. Evan Mobley was great in that last game. Has cashed it in both. So my concern now is the Celtics. They'll be very well aware of Evan Mobley's threat down low, and they might switch things up to slow him down. But they didn't do that with Bam. They kind of let him do what he does. So Evan Mobley over 15 and a half might be something I can entertain. But now the concern is Jared Allen. If Jared Allen's going to play, I don't like this line too much. So he's had a bit of success in the past. He took 15 shots in the last game, which is pretty good. 12 shots in the game prior. Did make a three-pointer as well. Doesn't get to the free throw line very much. So this makes a lot of sense to take the over. But the Jared Allen thing, that probably worries me the most. But his assist could be a good look. Two and a half. He has cashed this very well. Three and five assists in the two games so far. Hmm. But that's not why we bet these things, right? Just because they've happened in the past doesn't mean it will keep happening. Now, this is why I wouldn't bet it. The potential assists. Four and six potential assists, which means averaging five potential assists per game, and you need to make three of them. Yeah, it's probably just about right, this line. they are The Cavs are at home. Celtics are expected to be better. I get that. I think the line is just about right. At minus 130, I'm not overly excited to play that. His rebound line has gone up. It was at 10.5 in the last game. He only finished on 10. Now it is at 11.5 in this game. Now keep this in mind. The Boston Celtics were terrible at shooting that ball in that last game. And he still only finished with 10 boards, but he did have some foul trouble, right? So we saw some Tristan, Tristan Thomas. He still played 33 minutes, though, so I don't know what the fuck the problem is there. So in that first game where he had 13 rebounds, he had five offensive rebounds. So Cleveland's poor offense actually supported Evan Mobley getting some boards. In that last game where Cleveland were much better, he only had the one offensive rebound, which is why he went under. So part of the rebound play here for Mobley is for Cleveland not to shoot well. Points line projected at 101 for Cleveland. Boston are expected to improve, but yeah, I... Probably lean to the under, that's what I'm saying. 17 rebound chances in that last game. 11 and a half. Fuck, I don't know what I'm thinking anymore. I'm just going to pass on Evan Mobley. How about that? Because we've got that Jared Allen thing leaning over our heads as well. Uh, who else do we have in this godforsaken Cleveland Cavaliers team? Max Struess rebounds points. 10 and a half points. He's cashed this in four out of his last 10. Five and eight so far in this series. Against Orlando, he was pretty poor for the first four games. Cash this line twice out of seven games against them. 40 minutes, so the minutes are going to be there for Max. The shot attempts are there as well. It's just percentage. He shot 50% in that last game. Only two from seven from downtown, though. So that's not great. And yeah, he's cashing two out of four. So no strong lean, read, or whatever on Max Struess. But let's look at these rebounds. Four and a half to the line. He had six boards in the last game. Two boards in the first game, five and seven rebound chances. So those rebound chances are still quite low. Max Struess, he did have two offensive rebounds too. It's pretty wild. But I'm not overly excited by anything on Max Struess. Assists, two and a half. Oof. He's averaging 0 0.5 assists in two games so far. Two and three potential assists. Look at the under. The under makes a lot of sense to me. The under, four straight games he's gone under. His potential assists haven't been there for four straight games, to be honest. And in head-to-head -head matchups, he's averaging two potential assists. So for him to get three seems out, out, <laughs> outrageous, to be honest. So Max Struess under two and a half assists. It sounds like a real sweaty bet, but just based on what is happening at the moment, I can't see how he gets them. Similar to, see, similar to Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell is doing so much. He's creating so much. He's either taking the shot or creating the shot. Max Struess really not getting the opportunities here. Now, this is low. 
can get that on a couple loose balls, passing on a fast break, whatever it is. But yeah, the under two and a half assists, if he's getting two potential assists as an average, I can't help but consider taking that one for Max. Other than that, we got Isaac Okora, actually. He's someone who I've been thinking about betting on for a while, but yeah, there's no real odds available until we Jarrett Allen is confirmed or not. So one thing that I've been actually thinking, I've got one friend of mine, Tips with T. He used to make these videos with me at the start of the regular season. He's been absolutely killing it. Um, just in the last few days alone, 85 units profit on the on the uh, parlays that he's been putting together. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to see if I can get him on for an episode sometime this coming week and hopefully do a preview with me to maybe see where his thoughts are because he does look at the game a little bit differently than I do and that most people do, which is why he does so well. So, yeah, I might reach out to him to see if he wants to come on, do a preview with me. I feel like my thinking is very much aligned to a lot of the other people who are creating content. Uh, We talk about similar things. We assess it based off similar numbers. We use similar tools. I just present things different, obviously. But I might reach out to him to see if he'd be keen to come on. Um, maybe he can drop some knowledge on us because he's the probably the, he's the only person I know who's doing really well so far in this playoffs. But as I asked you earlier, if you know anybody else who is doing well in this playoffs, put their video, their Twitter, their video, their YouTube, their Twitter, their Instagrams, their whatever it takes. Just put their shit down in the comment section so I can check them out because maybe I'm missing something here. But I'm going to get finalized in my picks. Remember, check the winnable uh, link if you want to see what I'm betting on. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Sub to the channel because your boy's getting busy. Coming to your live west side of Sydney. We've got the free picks and the juice and the daily. It's all free. You don't even have to pay me.